Okay, so hello everybody. Um, I'm very pleased to welcome Brendan Lava, uh, who's very gratefully, uh, very generously agreed to talk to us today about <clears throat> his work on Lakatos. So Brendan is a uh, is from the uh, he's a philosopher from the University of Hertfordshire. Uh, he's a philosopher of mathematics. He's a big cheese in the philosophy of mathematical practice community, um, and he wrote a very good, in my view, very good textbook on. Lakatos, which you've been reading this week. So welcome, Brendan. Um, oh, thank you. Maybe we could start by, so you're a philosopher of mathematics, um, but of course we're discussing Lakatos in the context of his work on the philosophy of science today. Maybe we could start by sort of you telling us how you got interested in, in Lakatos and his, his work on the philosophy of science. Well, really from the mathematics side, right? So um, somebody sent me a list of interesting books uh, in philosophy of maths, um, and and uh, where are you on? There you are. Proofs and refutations was one of them. Um, and I thought, oh, this is terrific. So I read it, and then I thought, well, what do you do next? Uh, and I didn't know the answer to that. I realised the reason I didn't know the answer to that was because I didn't really understand the logic of his argument. Um, because it wasn't like any kind of philosophical argument I'd ever encountered before, so it was it was it was a doctorate-sized task to work out what the logic of his argument in that little book was, and that involved looking at everything he wrote, um, including the philosophy of science. So I had to get the hang of his philosophy of science, uh, just as as that kind of intellectual biography. Um, project. I also had to learn quite a lot about his early life. Um, so I had to learn more than most philosophers of maths do about um, Hungarian Marxism and Lukács and, and Hegel and stuff like that, uh, which were part of his um, part of his intellectual life. And I don't think were ever really expunged from his mental habits. Um, I don't think you get so thoroughly trained in Central European um, philosophical tradition and then just sort of throw it all off just because you've arrived um, at the LSE. <laughs> I don't think it works like that. Lovely. OK, so that's interesting. So you, you, you came at this, the stuff we're discussing today, really, out of a sort of broadening of your general interest in, in Lakatos. Um, yeah. So I've got some some questions about um, about Lakatos's way of thinking about uh, scientific disciplines, which I'm hoping you'll be able to help us with. So one question that people often ask when we discuss this is the issue of um, the scale of to which you should apply the notions of a research program. You know, so you can think of perhaps you could think about psychology as being a research program, or perhaps you could think about cognitive psychology, or perhaps you could think about mathematical cognition or, or you know, so there seems to be options of which scale you apply these as theoretical tools. Um, do you think there's a right way of doing that? Well, I'm fairly sure that um, names of disciplines and sub-disciplines is the wrong way. Um, because if you look at um, his examples of uh, research programmes, they're mostly from physics, um, and, and they're not the names of um, discipline areas. So um, he talks a lot, quite a lot about Niels Bohr, and basically it's, it's the, um, the program expressed in a single paper. Uh, so um, I, I, I guess if you're looking at, um, if, you're, if you're an originalist, that's to say if you think that the um, the way to think about things is to uh, reconstruct the, the views of the original authors of the antique documents that you're trying to understand, um, then it's going to be something like um, a, uh, a program is going to be something like the contents of a paper that's important enough to become canonical, that changes the direction of a lot of people's work. So bore writes a paper that earns a place in the history of physics because 
you know, a whole raft of people start change direction as well. So um, Lakatoshi's examples tend to be that kind of scale. Mm. Um, so not a whole book, but a paper that really um, is a corner on which the history of the discipline turns. But having said all that, I don't think there's anything in the logic of his position that requires that. Yeah. Um, uh, so if you were doing, if you were trying to take these ideas and um, take them somewhere else and do something else with them, I don't think there's um, any deep problem if the if you identified a research program that was either quite a bit smaller or quite a bit bigger than that. Mm. Okay, that's very helpful. Yeah, thank you. Um, here's a question for you then. So one one thing that I've always wondered about this is, is it definitely the case that if we're working in the same, so as you and I are working in the same research program, how do I know that you have the same idea as me about whether a particular assumption is within the hardcore or the protective belt? I mean, if we never talk about it, maybe, maybe we don't, we'll never find out that you actually have quite a different view than me. And if that's the case, in what sense could, can we be said to be actually be working in the same in the same program. Good. Um, well, if we if we bring the same um, techniques to the same problems, and um, and when we encounter um, counter evidence, we don't we don't fall out with each other about what to do about it. Um, so I suspect that, um, and this is where, um, you know, the shadow of Hegel starts to fall across the discussion, that it may only be retrospectively that, that you can, you can say, ah, yes, because, I mean, it may only be, um, so Hegel thinks that it's only after something's collapsed that you can really say what it means because you only only by that point you know what it's turned into, what its legacy is, um, and there may be something of that in this. That um, if a research program runs for a bit and then um, runs into trouble and people abandon it um, for something else, it may only be at that point that you can say, "Aha! We now know what the hardcore was because that was the thing they were all." You know, that was the Alamo they were trying to defend um, at the very end, the last redoubt. Yeah. Um, so in some sense, it's quite a, I mean, you, you comment in the chapter we've read that, um, you know, this is a very historically uh, oriented way of thinking about the philosophy of science. So in some sense, that fits with that view that, you know, perhaps this, this is really a tool for looking backwards. Um, so that's another question that, that often crops up when we read this chapter. So, um, is, is Lakatos, in your view, saying that this, this is how science has been done historically? Or is he saying that this is both how it's been done historically and how it should be done? You know, if I, if I just behave completely inconsistently with what he's saying, am I a bad scientist? Or am I just doing something new and different? Well, um, he's got to say that this is how most of science has gone historically, because his claim, or like this, how most of successful science has gone historically, right? So his claim is, um, you should believe my, you should prefer my model to Popper's model and Kuhn's model and, you know, whoever else, because um, my model um, makes people who we know to be great and successful scientists look like rational players yeah so um uh my model fits the historical data better so he's got to claim that um the really impressive bits of the history of, of science went um that match his model i'm carefully not saying they conform to his model it's it's you know that um it's not that it's not that Newton had some shadowy version of the methodology of scientific research programs in mind. Yeah. Some 
none of that. Um, but more of the history of science looks rational according to Lakatoshi's model. Um, and he also says that um, at the very least you should use his model to keep score. All right. Um, so this was his big argument with Feuerabend. So at one point, um, Lakatosh says something like, um, I can tell you using my model what's progressing and what's degenerating. And if a research program is degenerating, it should have its money cut and the people who work on it should be encouraged to do something else. Feuerabend Arben says, um, but you can only take, you can only keep score up to the present moment. You don't know that in future, um, any research program might um, recover its forces, rejuvenate, start to become progressive again. And if you've cut its money, um, that would be uh, bad. At this point, Lakatos says, no, 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 I'm not, all I'm talking, I'm not talking to you. It's not irrational to continue to work on a um, research program that's degenerating now, but you do have to be keep score honestly. But for me, that was, um, you know, that Feuerabend had won the essential point there. Uh -huh. um, because uh, at that point, this research, this research program stuff uh, has ceased to be a guide for action and become entirely a matter of scorekeeping. Um, I don't think... know how long you should give a, a, a degenerating program before it's... No, exactly. I mean, when it gets to a couple of centuries, surely, you know. Yeah. Um, so, but I think, um, I mean, that's what, well, that's, what, what, that's what went on between Lakatosh and Feuerabend. I'd have thought that um, it should be possible in given cases to say more than that. Um, you know, whether there's any scope for regeneration, whether there's um, some bits of the thing that have still got some life in them, um, or, or if all you're doing all day is, you know, ad hoc saving um, catches, then, you know, yeah. where, where is the... Is there anything other than a kind of sort of strictly formal hope that it might recover? Yeah. So this issue of the history um, uh, business of you know using successful examples from the history of science to sort of tell us that you know the, the, the successful examples all fit this this model. Is it there? Is it a problem then that the vast majority of Lakatos's examples are physics? I mean, should we be able to generalize to know that you know perhaps the successful examples in I don't know, neuroscience, quite different, maybe. Is that, is that a legitimate concern or not, do you think? Um, I think it is. Um, I mean, it, it wasn't just him, right? So, all, all, you know, philosophy is always a number of decades behind um, uh, the, the, the sciences. So all these guys are looking back to the heroic age of physics in sort of the interwar years when it was really exciting. Um, and there's lots of new stuff to talk about. But yes, um, I'd have thought so, because they, they, they never say this is philosophy of physics. It's always presented as philosophy of science. Mm. Um, so uh, yeah, I'd have thought mm. um, if you had I don't know, neuroscience or, or um, some other successful bit of science um, to, that just didn't fit. But yeah, that would be a problem. OK. Yeah. Um, at one point, uh, Lakatos says that uh, the distinction between a hardcore and a heuristic might just be a matter of convention. That's, that's the quote. What do you think that means? Um, well, you can. Um, Put the same thought either in indicative or um, imperative graphical moods, right? So if you think that um, if you think that all there really is in the world is corpuscules knocking into each other, um, you could say that. Um, so let's go. You know, we're back in the seventeenth century for a moment, right? Um, <laughs> You could say that, and that would be part of your hardcore, or 
um, you could, your heuristic would be try to explain everything in terms of collisions, right? I mean, it's really the same thought, but it's just in um, one is a statement, the other one's a, a, an instruction. Yeah. Um, and, and if you go through um, his examples of uh, research programs, it's not hard to make that same move to pick things out of the hardcore and turn them into instructions for research. Yeah. So they so they become heuristics or the other way. Okay. So is there no? I mean, some you know, some one reading of it, you know, it wouldn't be unreasonable it seems to me to interpret some of the, some some bits of Lakatos at least as sort of implying that the hardcore is more fundamental than the than the heuristic. But that what you just said suggests that it might be a misreading. I don't think it's a misreading. I think um, the uh, the hardcore idea comes from elsewhere. That's not him. That's um, already in philosophy of science. We think of it as the um, the Duhem Quine. Have you, do, are you all familiar with the Duhem Quine hypothesis? No. Tell us about that. So the Duhem Quine hypothesis is that you can believe anything you like. More precisely, you can um, hang on to any proposition you like, as long as you're prepared to make sufficiently violent changes to the rest of your belief system. So you want to believe the world's flat? You can, as long as you're prepared to do the considerable work of adjusting everything else you believe in order to accommodate the awkward counter evidence, right? And that's um, something that you know, philosophy of science students um, yeah. get taught as fairly basic stuff. So you might, for example, I don't know, believe that when you go around the world, you're actually hallucinating or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Or you're, you're, or you're actually going around the edge of the disc. Yeah, okay. Um, something like that. Um, there's a great book uh, about the flat earth stuff, um, which I... Garfield, Garf, something like that. Anyway, um, so that thought that there is a hard core to your beliefs, which is endlessly predictable, was already there in Quine mm. um, in the 50s, I guess. Um, and Lakatosh inherits that. So um, if you're starting from that thought, then the idea that the hard core is a bit harder than anything else, including the heuristic, is, is kind of built in. Mm. But then once he's built his model um, and starts to look at the cases, then the kind of fuzziness of the heuristic hardcore boundary is just a kind of inescapable feature of the cases that he's assembled. Yeah. Um, so then, so, so it is more of a kind of a retreat Okay. From where he started, but I think it's one he has to make. That's interesting. Okay. Here's a question. Why why did Lakatosh say that it's only rational to abandon your research program if there's a better one? Like surely it's surely it's possible for me to recognise that my work's going nowhere, I'm doing useless stuff, it's hopeless, and I should just, you know, give up. Um but maybe I don't have a better alternative, but but nevertheless I can surely recognise that something horrible is happening here. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, the thing he never sort of resiled from was was keeping accurate score. Right. So um, if your research program is degenerating, intellectual honesty requires you to recognize the fact so that um, uh, I mean, probably if it really is in trouble, then probably you should be looking for um, you know, a different discipline area, right? Or, you know, a change of career or something. Else. Job in management. Uh, or a job in management. <laughs> Listen, uh, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of important work to do uh, on the managerial side. But yeah, um, so I think, I think it's kind of constrained by, given that you're going to stay in science, um, uh, it, it, it's not irrational to, to, to plug on because um, apart from anything else, 
you may be assembling data that may be useful mm. um, for somebody else, yeah. right? So you think about think about Casubon, you know, working on the uh, the key to all mythologies. Well, he isn't going to succeed, and his research program um, is dead. But he's doing an awful lot of archival work. Who knows? That might that might turn out to be somebody comes along with a a fresh eye, with a fresh idea, um, they might yeah. be able to use that archive. Mm. Fantastic. One last question then, which is a bit of a sort of um, a, a question that really just interests, probably only interests me. Um, so apologies for that, but I'm curious. I'll, I'll, I'll let you know. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm curious as to how Lapitosh would, would think about importing disputes from other disciplines into a so, for example, I'm thinking in particular about how statistics is used in education and psychology. So there's this big dispute in statistics between the frequentist and Bayesian approaches to probability. And I think that could be, be accurately be characterized as a, you know, one of these conflicts between two research programs. They've got really different fundamental views. But quite often these days, you see psychologists and education researchers just cheerfully reporting analyses using both of these quite contradictory approaches in their papers. Um, and I've, I've done that myself and I've, I've, when I've done that I've always sort of thought to myself oh I wonder if this is a bit incoherent you know I'm, I'm just ignoring this big important dispute that statisticians have and just making my own progress what do you think Lakatos would, would, well, would think about that uh, and what do you think about that well um, I mean one thing is the thought we just had that you know um, it's, it's altogether normal to use data that's been collected under the aegis of some other program. Mm. Um, but also, so I happen to have, uh, I thought you might ask this. <laughs> um, so, so here we are in um, the collected papers. Um, and this is the methodology of scientific research programs. Um, where he's talking about, uh, so we're in section three, where he's, he's talking about uh, Niels Bohr. Uh -huh. um, and one of the points he makes about um, Bohr's program, he says, this is in italics. Some of the most important research programs in the history of science were grafted onto older programs with which they were blatantly inconsistent. For instance, Copernican astronomy was grafted onto Aristotelian physics, Bohr's programs onto Maxwell's. Elsewhere, he talks about Dirac. Um, uh, so what happens? Um, well, everybody else thinks that these grafts are irrational because of the inconsistency. I mean, other philosophers of science, right? Yep. The ones who are less wise in these matters than Lakatosh. Um, uh, but what actually happens, um, there's a peaceful coexistence until the young program that's been grafted on to something else that it's inconsistent with gets stronger, and then the inconsistencies become important. Um, and then it's the kind of edible thing um, the symbiosis becomes competitive and the champions of the new program try to replace the old program altogether. So, in other words, there are conditions under which it's perfectly normal for um, inconsistent chunks of scientific thinking to, to work together. Mm. Elsewhere, he talks about um, the early calculus as having, you know, I mean, that was inconsistent. That wasn't inconsistent with something else. That was just inconsistent, <laughs> right? Um, and everybody knew it, um, but they found a way of kind of quarantining the logical problem um, and using the techniques um, until such time as um, it became, they had the tools. To, to sort out the, the foundations. Mm. But you can crash on 
for a century or two with inconsistent foundations. Um, and you can know it and worry about it. And eventually you sort it out. But it, it, it doesn't paralyze things or it doesn't. I mean, Popperians would think that, oh, if there's an inconsistency in your um, belief set, that reduces everything to triviality. But clearly it isn't the case. Um, so I think, yeah, we've, we've got that. Yeah. Um, what you describe isn't quite the same situation because you haven't got uh, a young program um, being grafted onto something that it's inconsistent with. You've just got two research traditions, neither of which is able to defeat the other. Um, they're able to, um, I mean, we know as researchers on mathematics that most people don't care about the foundations. Um, the foundational questions are mostly, uh, you know, you need, you need special historical conditions where the foundational problems become pressing for anybody apart from found, you know, um, weirdos to worry about them. Um, so isn't that just what's happening in, in the case you described where there's usable stuff that you can nick and you just don't worry too much about? I think that's definitely is what's happening. Um, but I just, I guess I worry, and perhaps I think, you know, you, what you've just said is is sort of reassuring, I guess, in a way that perhaps, well, I guess in, in a way it's not, perhaps in a hundred years time, people are going to back, look back at these papers and go, oh, what, 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 were, they, what were they thinking of? <laughs> but um, yeah, I guess, you know, the, what, the, the way you approach statistics is probably related to your, well, it is related to your philosophy of science, whether you think you're testing hypotheses or whether you think you're accumulating evidence or, or whatnot. And so it does seem a bit strange to use these sort of self, well, not these contradictory approaches and just sort of sweep it under the carpet. But but maybe what you're saying is that, yeah, okay, that is a problem at some point that might might cause serious problems, but if it hasn't yet, we shouldn't we shouldn't really worry about it. Uh, well, you shouldn't you shouldn't stop what you're doing. Yeah. Um, because what you're doing might actually be part of the process of um, finding a, a, a solution to to your your kind of foundational dilemmas. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's I mean, um, how um, I mean, I guess the other thing that occurs to me is how heterogeneous is the evidence that you're collecting generally. So, I mean, um, we know that education research, in education research, one finds um, everything from, you know, very careful laboratory experimental um, work through to um, more um, experiential where you elicit the meanings of people's practices by making them make collages and um, keep uh, diaries and that kind of stuff. It's quite normal in educational research for people to combine really radically heterogeneous forms of um, evidence. Mm. And part of the skill of um this kind of social science is to is, is precisely to combine very heterogeneous um data or evidence in an intellectually honest way so that you're not just cherry picking things that you know you don't just fall into um utter confirmation bias yeah so if that's if that's a feature of educational research generally that we're already used to combining some stats with some um, student voice. Yeah, I guess that is a feature of the discipline. I, th I think it's it's perhaps less common, well, certainly not in my work anyway, to, to do that in the same kind of, um, <laughs> in the same project. Um, so it's really a case of you've got the same data and you're just analysing it in two different ways. Now, in almost every situation, those two different ways give you the same answer in, in some you know, substantive sense, 
but they are seeming to make quite different sort of statistical and philosophical assumptions, which. Okay, but that uh, you may have put your finger on it, actually, because there is um, there is this robustness test, isn't there? That um, uh, any research you do, any in sort of academic argument you make, will be within some kind of methodological or ideological frame. Um, and then you can test for robustness to see if versions of the same point pop up yeah in different frames so I mean, you get this in philosophy right so um if the same thought pops up in a heideggerian frame and a kind of you know strictly analytic analytic frame with a bit of translation care you think oh actually maybe this is a deep point maybe it isn't just an artifact of these particular intellectual traditions so um, maybe that's maybe that the answer to your question has got nothing to do with Lakatos. Maybe it's just um, that robustness test that if, if you get the same point turning out, however you slice it, yeah, then, it, then maybe it really is a deep point. So the danger, of course, then is you know if you do a hundred of these experiments and you do the same analysis, when you do the analysis in both ways, and and then on the hundredth time they give different results, then suddenly you're, oh, well, <laughs> what do I do now? And then uh, yeah, so I guess, but I guess the, the the point is is that that's when if that happens, that's when these conflicts come to the fore, and we've got to start thinking about it a bit more carefully, and that's when progress is made. Right. So so. Um now you've got a picture of how it's possible um for these in how it's possible for these inconsistencies to be unproblematic for quite a long time and then suddenly come to a boil yeah yeah well that's fantastic thank you very much for uh, giving up your time to talk to us um i've taken up much more of your time than i said i would but i enjoyed talking to you very much so i hope i hope um you don't uh, object to me wasting your time for too long um I will I will stop recording now and just say thank you once more, Brendan. Really appreciate it. Oh, you're very welcome.